This video is just a brief introduction to the uh, most important points of Tophonius uh, as, a, as an anatomy lesson, uh, if nothing else. So to start with, we just want to go through the um, more important features of what Tophonius has to offer, and so you can see the parts in action. Okay, so the obvious thing about Tophonius when you look at it is we have a computer here. So this computer is a self-contained touchscreen computer. There are no other parts to the computer. It's all contained here. And this communicates with the auxiliary system, which is shown on this little auxiliary screen here. So this is our main PC. This is our auxiliary screen. And those two parts are different from perhaps most normal ventilators. But after that, things become very familiar. If we just move this to the side, we'll see that we have a standard um, Tech 5 vaporizer here, the Select Tech back fittings for putting two vaporizers side by side uh, of any Select Tech type. We have standard oxygen, standard air flow meters. Oxygen is standard on all machines. Air and or nitrous can be added as required <coughs> at time of, um, of ordering. The other um, flow meter that you'll see here, which is slightly unusual, is a scavenging flow meter. This um, indicates the uh, scavenging flow rate for the evacuation system, which we'll look at later on the rear of the Tophonius machine. Um, in the center here, we have the hospital oxygen pressure. This measures the pressure of the incoming oxygen on the oxygen supply line. And to the left of that, the oxygen cylinder pressure. As you'll see very shortly, uh, we do have capacity for two oxygen cylinders to be connected to the machine so the machine can run in a, in a truly self-contained manner. Here we have the airway breathing system pressure. You'll be familiar with this typical manometer breathing uh, system uh, pressure read reading and go from 0 to 60 centimeters of water pressure. These buttons, all related to the function and performance of the auxiliary system, will come to those in a, in a later video. Similarly, the assist, the run, the peep, and the dump valve are all to do with the running of the machine. We have an oxygen flush here in the normal way, and that will deliver 70 liters a minute direct into the patient circuit, bypassing the vaporizer when you press that button. Because it's a computer, we have a flexible, bendy, waterproof keypad here for keyboard entry into the computer system. We also have a drawer here where you can cut things out and put in your crash cart um, supplies <coughs> so they're immediately available when you need them. I'm putting this round to the front. We have here is just a little um, guidance light if you need an extra light during um, late night surgeries. Right at the top of the machine, we have what's called the Solomon uh, Physiological Monitor. Solomon measures invasive blood pressure, ECG, pulse oximetry, temperature, and all the breath measurements, CO2, agent, and oxygen. All the input lines to the monitor are fed up through this umbilicus here, which you'll see later connects with the front of the um, uh, machine to the Y piece. All items come up here. The water trap is held just inside here on the side of the Solomon monitor and just clips into place. Also, we have the IVP, ECG, pulse ox and temperature lines coming into the side of the Solomon monitor. What isn't perhaps immediately obvious is that at the side here, we have a manual breathing bag uh, extension so that we can put a breathing bag on here if we ever need to manually ventilate in the event of um, battery failure or power failure uh, during the use of Tophonius. Just moving that to one side, the last thing to point out, here's an air intake filter. The air intake filter is placed there so that air can be sucked in from the room and used using uh, via a small um, internal pump to generate its own air source, in which case the provision of an air meter and piped air is not required. 
we'll see later how the air and oxygen can be automatically mixed to, to create your own FiO2. Uh, the valve block lies here under the uh, drawer and is swiveled to, to move around to um, change direction of where your, where your horse is positioned. It has an inspiratory and an expiratory limb and this valve block cover is held in place by six screws, which thumb screws which undo and allow you to lift the cover and take the valves off. Below here, we have the battery compartment. Found here. And in the battery compartment, we have two batteries uh, and some spare fuses. The batteries are long life, deep discharge batteries and in a water protective ca um, container here it doesn't matter if these get wet at all during washing and cleaning afterwards. The tubes running up from the soda lime uh, absorber tray which we'll, we'll come to in a moment uh, come down to the bottom of the machine where we have on this particular model uh, an auxiliary tap to use as part of the manual ventilation system. If, as mentioned before, we require to Im implement manual ventilation, then we would simply take this tube, remove the cap, undo this bracket, and put this one on here, and then we're able, with a bag on here, to perform manual ventilation. With a bag in place here, a 30 litre bag, one can stand here and compress and ventilate in the normal way. The spill valve is conveniently located at the top and the exhaust from the spill valve is taken around to the exhaust manifold and dealt with in the same way as all the other gases from the, uh, from the patient circuit. The only other thing to mention at the bottom of the, of the machine now is the soda lime pan which lies here and we'll cover this fully in the next part of the video. At the back of Tophonius we have um, some important um, components that we need to look at. This here is what's called an RCD, RCD or residual current device, and otherwise known as a trip switch or an ICD device. This is to protect against uh, faults in the earth circuit um, if there's a danger of uh, excessive earth leakage current. What that really means is in practice is that this should be on with the mains connected and the little green light should be on. If there's a, a fault in the earth current, or perhaps sometimes during a thunderstorm, this may trip off. Okay? It's important when, when you start the machine, come to look at the machine, that this is turned on. Because the machine will run on batteries, it's not always obvious, despite the information on the screens, that it's running on batteries. So as a first check in the morning, we should make sure that this, this light is on. When this one's on, these auxiliary sockets are powered and a green light will appear here. If this green light isn't on, then the mains isn't on and there's no supply. You should also be aware that these sockets are not supplied with mains electricity when it's running on batteries. There is no inverter. So if you're running a syringe pump or syringe driver from these sockets, then you have to be connected to the mains to feed through to these. Okay. Following down from this, we come down to the lower part of the machine and here we have a uh, charcoal absorber and a small rebreathing bag. And shortly I'm going to open the door and show you the, the exhaust manifold system and explain how these two components fit in with um, uh, a, a vacuum system. In the back of the machine we have the uh, gas connections for air, oxygen and vacuum and or nitrous if that's required. Further down we have what we refer to as the main cylinder. This is the cylinder. At the bottom of the cylinder, we have the absorber pan, which is where the soda lime sits. Right at the bottom, we have two drain plugs. At the end of a surgery or end of the day, these plugs can be undone, taken out, and the valve block removed or disassembled, and flushed through with water and, and cleaning agent, and drained out through here. Once cleaning is complete, these can go back in, and uh, be tight and ready for use. Uh, I'm now going to describe and talk about the scavenging uh, vacuum system and the various methods of um, dealing with uh, 
waste gas from the uh, anesthetic circuit. Okay, with the door open now, we can see some of the inside of the machine, and I'll just briefly run through some of these components, just so that people are aware of what they are. Uh, this is the charger, upper and lower chargers for the two batteries, one for the lower, one for the upper battery. The power from those is fed into a what we call the power board, and the power board has on it a number of uh, lights and LEDs in various places. Um, the only reason they're there is to help me in terms of uh, determining a problem during servicing or over the phone if you have a battery problem. That's the power board. This is a commonly referred to component. This is called the dump valve and this is the exhaust manifold. Now the exhaust manifold can be used in a variety of ways. If you have a vacuum line here pulling a vacuum through this here, you will remember on the front of the machine there was a flow meter for the vacuum and that vacuum flow meter would be turned up to typically 8 or 10 liters a minute so near maximum and gas would be sucked out here it goes through the vacuum line and the vacuum line comes to here this pipe is the only connection to the patient circuit so when the, the ventilator needs to remove gas so there's a constantly gas being added by the fresh gas flow and the, the a uh, ventilator needs to spill gas in the normal way, it'll do so through this pipe. And the only exit port is via this dump valve. So when this valve opens, the excess gas gets dumped quickly into the bag and the bag will be seen to, to fill slightly. The scavenging line will quickly draw gas away from the bag, that's emptying the bag and removing the waste gas without any spillage. If for any reason the vacuum line fails or is a large volume of gas delivered to the bag that exceeds the ability of this to remove it quickly, then the excess gas will spill out through this activated F-air charcoal canister into the air, which means that no agent, uh, anesthetic agents, uh, are released into the air. If a vacuum system isn't in use, and this isn't used, then an alternative approach it would be to have no bag here, and have a pipe here going to your, your um, passive or semi-active scavenging system. This may be fed from an air brake or simply to a hole in the wall. <clears throat> Again, the same principle applies if the gas delivered here is in excess of the ability for the pipe or um, system that's in use to remove it, excess gas will go through the F-air canister, um, thus inactivating it. Moving along inside the, the, the circuit, this is the main motor for the, the drive and it makes the piston go up and down. And this here is an air pump, which we'll discuss later as the control for mixing internally air and oxygen for a specific FiO2 mix. Here on the side, probably can't see it very well, but it's not that important, are some circuit boards that are the main heart of the machine. Uh, similarly, there's some uh, circuit boards uh, deeper inside. One point to mention, this is what's known as the VIX drive. And the VIX drive has a very important um, function in this machine in that it controls the whole motor uh, movement. On the VIX drive, uh, when it's on, are some colored lights. And in the event of um, a, a service feature or a problem that you may encounter, uh, you may be asked by a technician what the color of the lights are. And they'll ask you what are the color of the lights on the VIX drive. And this is what we're referring to uh, as the VIX drive. OK, what we're going to do now is close the door. We're going to power the machine and go through some of the mo more important points of the machine when it starts up. In this section, we're going to have a quick look at the action of Tophonius and why is it different from any other ventilator that you may have already used. In a traditional ventilator, uh, a bag and a bellows, you have an ascending or descending bellows, the air inside of which is the air that's um, connected to the patient breathing circuit. Compressed air outside the bellows, but within the um, chamber itself, forces the bellows either down or up and forces air into the patient. Um, the l limitation of that is that you don't really know accurately how much uh, is being delivered. It's difficult to control the rate at which it's being delivered. Um, and also, 
when the animal breathes spontaneously, it either has to work against the descending bellows or work to raise the bellows if they're ascending bellows. It all, the animal also has to work to overcome resistance in breathing tubes, resistance in soda line, and valves in the circuit. The way Tophonius is different is that we produced a system that has a piston that uh, moves up and down, <coughs> and that piston is induced to move by constant monitoring of pressure in the airway. So here we have a number of points of takeoff. We have our standard central sampling line for our gases. But this one here is an additional one on a Tophonius Y piece, which is a pressure sampling port. And this pressure sampling line runs back to the internal part of the machine to one of the internal pressure sensors. Pre pressure sensors. So on that pressure sensor, uh, the, the pressure is registered and then fed to the microcontroller. And the, then the system will move or, or create the piston to be moved in a manner such as to negate the, the signal. So in other words, if I breathe into this Y piece and the pressure increases my even quarter of a centimeter, the piston will move up to negate that change in pressure. If I breathe in and create a negative pressure, the piston will move down to negate that pressure. So by breathing very, very gently, the piston will move up and down, which is why we refer to the piston rather and the cylinder <coughs> as a virtual bag rather than as a, as a cylinder and a piston. To demonstrate this, I'm just going to breathe gently into here. And you're going to see on the screen the representation of the piston moving as I do so. I won't be breathing hard, but you'll see the piston move um, in response to my breaths. So very, very little pressure but I was able to move the piston up and down, as you can see. In so doing, the numbers in brackets um, above the uh, static legends are above TV, 713. So my tidal volume was 713 mils. The RR, my measured respiratory rate was 8.7 breaths per minute. My inspiratory time was 3.2 seconds. And the maximum pressure I achieved was three. So even though I breathed that in a normal way, the pressure rose to three piston moved away from me and negated the pressure. So we have very small undulation of pressure. Because the pressure is sensed here, all the work in, is done by the piston over here, the work of breathing through these tubes, through the uh, valves, through the soda line, is all done by the piston. The work of breathing is very, very much reduced for a spontaneously breathing animal. And it's this servo system that makes Tophonius unique. I think as I as show later in the video, if I were to uh, put a cap on this uh, white piece now, um, and with the standard spontaneous breathing, we're servoing to a zero pressure. In other words, we're doing everything we can to get to a zero pressure. However, if we change the reference point and zero to a positive pressure, we've instantly created a CPAP function. Or if that we're ventilating, we've instantly created a PEEP function. It would be possible, although they're not implemented in this machine, to create a NEEP function and zero and servo to a, a, a value less than zero. The, the possibilities are um, quite many with this type of system. But the most important feature, I think, is the servo response means that animals as small as maybe five, six kilograms could breathe on a circuit like this without any undue resistance. And it works in the other direction, up to animals of 1,500, 1,600 kilos. So these are the unique features that make Tophonius different from a standard bag in the bottle ventilator. So we're now going to look at the um, function and performance of the auxiliary system, which is all running on this central auxiliary screen. Uh, at the moment, we're not going to have the computer coming on at all. We're just going to look at the auxiliary system. Uh, it's called an auxiliary system, but in fact, it is the main heart of the machine, and it is, in fact, the part that controls all of the ventilator functions. The Windows interface is a nice, colorful touchscreen interface to enable you to control the computer, uh, control the ventilator, rather, uh, by a, a standard Windows computer. But the essence on the uh, fine control and the safety control is all done by the auxiliary computer. 
Now, in the in, uh, instance that um, there's a problem with your Windows or uh, your computer's not running, or you bought a machine that doesn't have this feature, then you'll be running the machine on the auxiliary system. So it's important to understand how and what the auxiliary system does. So we're going to start the machine. A number of things are going to happen. This screen is going to light up, and it's going to go through a series of checks uh, and check the machine before it's ready to run. Each check will be accompanied by either a short beep, uh, sorry, a short double beep or a long beep. The double beep is to indicate that all is well, and a long beep to indicate that there may be a problem. The idea behind this uh, procedure is such that you can start the machine and then go about your business preparing the ET tubes, preparing the anesthetics, uh, getting the room ready. And if you hear beep, 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 you know all is well. If you hear a long beep, uh, then you'll know that there's something amiss. It could be as simple as the mains not being connected or the oxygen supply pressure not being connected. Um, but you need to come back to the machine and have a look at the screen to see what it says. So we're going to start the machine up. So it starts, checks the battery voltages, beep, 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 all is well, checks the mains connection, checks the combined battery voltages, just a number of checks to, to make sure that everything is as it should be. Now it's preparing uh, to check the VIX drive to make sure that that can um, be controlled. Double beep means it's okay. The buzz there was the vacuum um, pump being turned on to um, confirm that that's working and to test the vacuum. And then we had a long beep because there was a, a no oxygen supply connected to this machine at the moment. There are some options, uh, a couple of options available when you get to a certain point uh, to enable you to do a a leak test in the auxiliary system and or to change the pressure offset, uh, both of which we'll come back to in a short while. Having completed its series of checks, if we get to this point where the uh, run IPPV button is flashing, then we know that everything is ready to go. Um, the screen is now also flashing a text message that says, piston now needs to be initialized, disconnect patient and push run button. What this for is for is that the the piston uh, knows very accurately, accurately its position, but like a weighing scale, it needs to be zeroed before use. So we're going to take the piston right to the bottom, so we know the bottom position, and from there on, in this point, we'll know exactly where the piston is at any time. So when we push this, we have to make sure that there's nothing connected at the end of the ET tube, otherwise we're going to be ventilating against a closed circuit, and the machine will... Um, or stop its initialization and ask us to remove the stopper. So we push the button, we hear the piston descending, it gets to the bottom, so after initialization you hear the three beeps and a long beep to indicate that it's uh, arrived and all is well and is in the auxiliary system, and then you heard one long beep there because we still have no oxygen supply connected, so it was um, now appearing as a flashing warning on the screen. Uh, in addition, the warning is also saying that the piston is at the reserve, out of reserve volume because it's right at the bottom. Uh, in practical terms, if you were ventilating and the piston got right to the bottom, you have no reserve left. You cannot force any more gas in, and it's just warning you that you you got to the limit of your ventilating. In that, in that instance, you'd purely uh, increase the fresh gas flow, put more gas into the cylinder, so you had some reserve left. Okay, so now we've arrived in this. Um, uh, auxiliary screen, we need to just look at some of the components and understand what the controls do. So basically we have four knobs along the bottom. Very simply they are TV for tidal volume, RR for respiratory rate, IT for inspiratory time, and NWL for maximum working pressure limit. Uh, the use of these knobs is straightforward. If you turn one of the knobs, the value will change. Um, and you'll see a little asterisk appear next to the, uh, the setting name. If you don't push one of the knobs after turning it, the value will go back to its original value. Uh, so to change the value, put it to where you want it, and then push, and you hear a, um, a short confirmatory beep to show that it's been committed. Um, the uh, unit has some intelligence uh, in as much as it won't allow you to set a respiratory rate that would violate an inspiratory time. It won't allow you to set an inspiratory time that would violate a respiratory rate. It also won't allow you to set a tidal volume and an inspiratory time that would violate its maximum flow rate. However, the maximum flow rate of Tophonius 
is of the order of a thousand liters a minute, which is far in excess of most um, equine ventilating machines. So it's unlikely that you'll exceed its um, inspiratory flow rate maximum. So when the um, unit is in this state, you would then set the machine up for your um, tidal volume, respiratory rate, and inspiratory time as per your patient, commit them, and then pre-fill the cylinder by um, opening the gas and allowing the cylinder uh, to fill through gas that's going through the vaporizer. So um, that's what we're going to do now. So now we're going to pre-fill the um, cylinder with um, oxygen and anesthetic agent. To do this, you must place a stopper on the end of the Y piece so that it's a closed system, and then open the oxygen um, flow and flow gas through the vaporizer. If you wish to pre-fill with anesthetic agent, turn the vaporizer on to your preferred setting, or keep it off for just filling with oxygen uh, as a without anesthetic agent. As gas flows into the, into the cylinder, the servo action of Tophonius means that the piston will now rise and, can, and the cylinder will fill with gas. This is shown on the screen as an as a indication of the um, piston level and the number at the top is the actual level of volume under the piston. Now, this introduces some concepts that we need to understand regarding tidal volume and buffer volume. The concept of the buffer volume is that we have a tidal volume which will be delivered when we press the ventilate button, but also there's a buffer volume which allows us to fill the system to a certain size in excess of the tidal volume. What this means is that we may thereby dictate how big the system is and how quickly it will respond to um, changes in anesthetic concentration. To understand this concept, um, we're going to take a tidal volume of 5 litres for our typical 5 kilogram horse. So we'll set that to 5. If I press and hold this button, a new button, a new option will appear, say BV, which is our buffer volume. I'm going to set this to 10. And now the combined buffer volume and tidal volume is 15 litres. What this means is we've now created what is effectively a rebreathing bag of 15 litres. Once the, the um, volume of the bag or piston reaches 15 litres, the spill valve, or the, in our case the dump valve, will open and allow gas to exit the system. The system will grow no larger than 15 litres. However, when you press the ventilate button, 5 litres will be delivered only. So we're now going to have a 5 litre um, delivery system within a total 15 litre capacity. So now we hear clunk clunk. These two little asterisks here indicate that the valve is open and gas is now being removed and the, the volume in the system will go no bigger than 15 litres. So we can turn this off. So turn the gas flow off, the valve no longer opens and the system is now primed ready for use. The idea with buffer volume is that for a in our example here, we set it to two times the typical tidal volume of the animal, so that with the um, an additional single tidal volume, we have a three times tidal volume capacity to facilitate the very large breath that horses often take at the beginning of an anaesthetic. Once the anaesthesia is settled and the horse is breathing normally, this buffer volume can be dropped to three or four litres to really minimise the circuit volume and improve circuit response. Okay, a number of other features we'd like to look at here are um, the maximum working pressure limit we described. This is changeable, and what this means is that uh, if the pressure ever gets to this level, it, the piston, if ventilating, will stop ventilating. And if it's in spontaneous mode and we reach this level, uh, which is more unlikely, but um, it is possible, if that happens, then the dump valve will open to release the pressure. We prime the system. There is a stopper on the Y piece at the moment. So I'm going to do a little demonstration to show you how the maximum working pressure limit uh, works in practice. I'm going to set the tidal volume back to one litre. Oop. 
and my inspiratory time to four seconds. So I'm going to deliver a very small volume over a long period of time. We have my maximum working pressure limit of 35. We will see the pressure slowly, slowly rise. When it gets to 35, the piston will stop and um, come back and, and try again. That one litre probably isn't quite enough, so I'm going to increase that to a little more. And this time we should see the pressure rise to 35. The alarm indicates that we've exceeded the maximum working pressure, and this is shown on the screen. But the, the ventilator simply went back, waited the required amount of time, and is repeating it, it again. By raising the maximum working pressure limit, we can stop this happening until a much higher pressure. So that's the action of the maximum working pressure limit. It works very carefully to prevent any excess pressure developing in the system and to protect the horse. Okay, having made that setting, We've actually created a respiratory rate of eight um, breaths per minute with an inspiratory time of four seconds, which is now violating our one-to-one -one, um, IE ratio. Hence the IE ratio um, legend is now flashing. The ventilator will allow you to set an IE ratio of less than one-to-one, -one, but it generally considers it a bad idea, and that's why it's flashing. If you press ventilate, it will operate in that manner, but with such large animals as, as this, uh, you may find you get breath stacking. So it's going to flash until the IE ratio is, is back to a more realistic value. So if we return the IT back to 2, we now have an IE ratio of 1 to 2.7, and the flashing has stopped. Above the IE uh, ratio, we have the inspiratory flow based on our settings. So currently we have 1.5 litres in 2 seconds, which equates to 45 litres a minute. Typically, we would deliver two liter, uh, uh, our inspiratory volume into uh, two seconds. So for a five litre horse, five litre tidal volume for a horse, this would equate to an inspiratory flow of 150 litres a minute, and this would be shown here. Because we know the, the um, tidal volume and we know the respiratory rate, we have the a uh, minute volume shown at the top as well. Um, and lastly, at the bottom, by simple maths, the expiratory time is shown as five and a half seconds. All those items are non-configurable and are directly resulted in, result as a setting of these uh, primary control knobs. Okay, moving on. So we now know that the figure at the top is 11.8 liters, that's the volume under the piston. BV is our buffer volume. Our maximum working pressure limit is 30, and we have a CIS set to 60, and we have CPAP set to zero. Let's briefly discuss CPAP. In this spontaneous mode, we can set a CPAP value, um, and the machine will do all that is possible to maintain this CPAP value. It's very easy to do. We press the CPAP value, uh, CPAP button, and hold it, and we see on the screen that it changes to CPAP. We then change that to our CPAP required setting, let's say 10, and push it. The piston moves to create a pressure, as shown on here, of 10 centimetres, and it'll maintain that and do everything it can. So if a horse was connected and started to breathe in or breathe out, it will do everything it can to keep it at 10, hence CPAP. To come out of CPAP, push the button, turn this to zero, press one, and the CPAP will go to zero. The figure above that is the assist value, and to briefly <coughs> describe assist, if we push the assist button, <coughs> the button is flashing, indicating that assist is available, um, but not yet in action because we're not ventilating, and the MWPL has now changed its um, letters to sense for sensitivity. The assist mode in Teponius is a flow-based system rather than a pressure-based system. So in many systems, a negative pressure will induce 
an assisted breath, but in Tophonius it's a minimum flow that's required. So at the moment the setting is 60 litres per minute, meaning that the animal needs to draw an inspiratory flow of at least 60 litres a minute to trigger the breath. This setting can be changed and committed in the normal way to adjust the sensitivity. And the sensitivity is related to an animal's ability to make a breath rather than its um, actual weight or bodily size. It would be fair to say that a strong foal or yearling would be able to develop maybe 180, 200 litres per minute fairly easily, uh, whereas a 500 kilogram moribund septic colic horse may not have that the ability and may need a, a trigger setting much nearer 100 or 60. So the setting is relative to ability rather than actual size. To, um, to run the assist function, you would press the run button. Now it wishes to ventilate and ah, we have a low breathing pressure because there's nothing attached. Let's clear that. So in this mode, the assist is ready when we push that a ventilator, um, ventilation will occur if the animal um, makes an effort. If it doesn't make an effort, then the respiratory rate has been reduced to a third and a mandatory volume ventilation will be implemented one third of the original minute volume.